All right. Uh, so thank you guys for uh, coming in here. Uh, so I guess my uh, talks about uh, development and compliance. Uh, my colleague here uh, couldn't make it uh, because of some logistical issues. Uh, you know, before I can get started, you know, just a show of hands. You know, how many of you, uh, as part of your development, had a run-in with compliance? Uh, okay. Uh, all right, and then I guess not a whole bunch here, but you know, how many of you, I, I guess, of those who had a run-in, you know, absolutely love or hate compliance, or I guess implementing it. All right, so you know, let's uh, let's get uh, started. So you know, in terms of my background, uh, my background is a uh, development background. So you know, I've been working for a few years now, like six years for Foundstone, uh, doing AppSec work. Uh, you know, white box, black box. Uh, I'm also a PCI DSS uh, qualified uh, security assessors. Uh, so doing compliance from that standpoint. Uh, but like I said, you know, before I you know switched sides, I was a developer, and my first run-in with compliance was as a developer, right? So now I'm on the other side of things. The 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 goal here is, uh, you know, every time I guess most times we are doing compliance audits. Uh, there's a big gap between what the compliance says and, and what gets interpreted, right? So the compliance uh, regulations aren't the most uh, clear. Uh, they have quite a few ambiguities, multiple ways to interpret them. Uh, and you, know, you end up with a situation where the product is still not compliant, right? So the goal is to kind of uh, uh, go over like the top 20 things or 25 things, right, as a developer. Uh, that you want to kind of be doing so that you are on the right side of compliance, right? A, a lot of compliance, or uh, I guess before I go ahead, you know, this, this is not a comprehensive co compliance class, right? Uh, a lot of compliance also have a concept of compensating control, right? And, and what that means is, you know, I'm not doing X, Y, and Z that the compliance asks me to, but I'm doing A, B, C, D, E, and F, uh, based on which you could go to the compliance committee or the standards body and say, hey, you know, because I'm doing A through F, give me an exception, right? So uh, uh, compensating controls are exceptions, not the norm. Uh, so the idea is, you know, even if you are not doing certain things, you might still be able to be compliant. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, you know, becoming compliant is just not about the things that I talk about here, right? There, there are more things to comply. Uh, you know, what, I tr what I'm trying to put forth in the bunch of next slides is the top, you know, X things that when an auditor is assessing your product or your application, uh, it's going to be like a flag, right? So uh, the top X things, uh, but not all of the things, right? So uh, I guess. So here's kind of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, agenda, so to speak. A little bit of background, uh, and then uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the best practices or the top X things, uh, what I've done is I've kind of broken it down into uh, uh, technology, people, and process. Uh, so we'll uh, look at each of them uh, one after the other. Uh, so uh, to start with, right, the need for regulatory compliance, right? You know, if you if you've been following news uh, in the past few years, you know there have definitely been a few you know headline grabbers, right? Like a few infamous cases, uh, in the Heartland payment systems, the TJX case, where you know millions of uh, cardholder uh, were impacted because of their uh, credit card numbers being disclosed. Uh, Telstra, you know, this is back down in Australia, uh, where you know thousands of users had their personal information leaked through the application. Uh, uh, from the healthcare standpoint, a few Massachusetts area hospitals who had a common service provider lost data on again a, a quite a few uh, patients uh, having diagnostic details. Uh, and then another, you know, like veteran affairs uh, uh, organization lost uh, details on millions of uh, veterans, I guess. So the whole goal of these compliances 
is to stop this from happening, right? It's to protect the end users uh, and their data that these uh, third party or the applications collect from you, right? That, that's the whole goal. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess from an intent standpoint, like I said, safeguarding the sensitive data. Uh, and, and by safeguarding, what we mean is ensuring that uh, it's confidential, it's only accessible to the right uh, people, uh, uh, and so forth. Now, uh, the common reason, right, why there's this disconnect between the development community and the compliance uh, uh, regulations. Uh, one is, if you, if you have happened to read these compliance regulations, right, they, they, the wording tends to be legal, right, like it tends to be written by lawyers more than a developer or an architect or, 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 or somebody on the technical side, right? Uh, it's, it, th there are different ways to interpret it. Uh, and, and the other kind of thing that it uh, causes the disconnect or the misinterpretation uh, is that most commonly the regulation will say, you know, this is what you've got to do, right? This is the end result. Uh, but there's nothing said about, you know, what I need to do to in order to achieve it, right? So different people potentially interpret it in different ways, you know, some acceptable, some non-acceptable. Uh, and hence you kind of end up in the situation which is kind of really bad that, you know, you spend X hours studying this compliance uh, and making sure is your app is compliant. Uh, only to find out that when an external auditor came into the scene, uh, you know, he said it's non-compliant because your uh, protections are not enough, right? So now, not only have you spent this X hours already, but you are going to have to spend another Y hours fixing it. So it's kind of a pretty bad situation to get into. And, you know, on the contrary, if you've seen these regulations, Right? The, while it may be very ambiguous on how you achieve it, you know, it's pretty well defined, distinct uh, on the way uh, or I guess on the impact of non-compliance. Right? There are very clear cut fines written up as, uh, as an impact of non-compliance uh, or for that matter even <coughs> potential prison time. Uh, leave alone the fact that maybe because of non-compliance, you know, because of the press, you're going to have uh, potentially a, a PR issue, potentially an issue where your customers don't really have the same amount of confidence in you, uh, don't really trust you with your data, uh, which eventually leads into a bus lack of business revenue. So the impact is pretty clear cut. However, the, 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 the means to achieve compliance is pretty ambiguous. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, most compliance uh, regulations uh, have a pretty wholesome approach to achieving compliance, right? So they will touch upon operational security, they will touch upon network security, uh, they will touch upon physical security, and then they will touch upon application development security, right? So, so for today's discussion, you know, all we are focusing uh, is on, uh, from an application developer standpoint, you know, what are the uh, things to be doing, things to not be doing. So some uh, sample uh, compliance regulations that you probably uh, heard or run into, the payment card industry probably is one of the most famous, uh, you know, applies to systems that deal with uh, uh, payment card data, maybe credit card, maybe debit card, uh, you know, whatnot. Uh, European Union has its uh, data protection directive uh, to make sure that, you know, this, the information that the application or the system collects uh, is protected and the user knows uh, who, who has access to it. Uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA uh, in the US, safeguarding uh, healthcare data, uh, Sarbanes Oxley, Basel, again, more of a European standard. So, you know, some compliance uh, regulations out there that you potentially run into. All right, so, you know, so what have I done here? Uh, essentially what I've done is, you know, mapped these compliance regulations into, uh, into categories uh, that you can relate to as a developer, right? So essentially what I've done is uh, come up with these categories here uh, 
uh, like data protection and storage and transit, you know, most of them like self-explanatory, what falls in them. Uh, uh, but the idea is going forward in the next slide, uh, we'll look at each category and the do's and don'ts in those categories from a compliance standpoint. Uh, and, and the only reason for this categorization and this mapping uh, is so that you can relate to it. Right? You don't have to look through the legal wordings uh, to actually understand what it's trying to imply. So here's a, a, like some of the uh, uh, top X things in our data protection and storage and transit. Uh, the first one here, you know, kind of actually sounds like a no-brainer, right? Only store, transmit uh, sensitive data if you cannot do without it. Uh, but, you know, give it a thought, right? You know, anytime you are dealing, processing this data uh, that the compliance regulation wants to safeguard, you know, give it a thought uh, whether my app can function, whether my business can function without this data, right? Uh, so, you know, one of the common examples uh, uh, that we have run into is uh, credit card refund systems, right? Now, some systems, credit card refund systems, the way they have, de the way they are designed and the environment in which they function, you know, they can work without storing the whole credit card number. They can store the last four digits uh, and verify that and based on that process the refund, right? So, so the idea is if you're not storing it, if you're not processing it, you don't have this overhead of complying with it, right? So give it a thought. It's, you know, depending on your situation may not be possible, uh, but at least give it a thought because if you're not storing it or truncating it, uh, not storing it completely, you know, you don't have to live with this overhead of compliance. Uh, from a cryptographic standpoint, you know, as appealing as it sounds, you know, cryptography is pretty hard to implement securely, right? It's one of those things that's easy to do wrong. So, uh, you know, you might write a homegrown, you know, algorithm uh, which can run on multiple processors, give you the uh, most awesome performance, uh, but, you know, stay away from, you know, homegrown crypto algorithms. Right. There are plenty of libraries out there uh, that have implementation of uh, well-known, well-researched uh, cryptographic algorithms uh, that you can simply use rather than writing it uh, you know, something from the ground up. Uh, open SSL, you know, if you are doing uh, programming or your development in C, C++, Windows or Unix, you could use Open SSL. Right. If you are a .NET, .NET has a pretty rich uh, library of uh, crypto uh, uh, implementation. Java, same thing. So you really shouldn't run into a situation where uh, you have to write up something on your own uh, for your uh, crypto news. Uh, so th this next one, which says, you know, use strong way, one way hashes uh, to ensure integrity. Uh, so I, I guess the idea there, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of jump ahead. Uh, next to the next one, which is whenever possible, use strong, strong one-way hashes rather than reversible encryption algorithm. So the idea is, you know, a, a very quick primer on one-way hash. Uh, a one-way hash is something that takes your input uh, like a string and gives you a hash as the output, right? There's no way to go back from a hash to the clear text string, right? There's just no way, uh, given that the algorithm is secure enough. Uh, so, the idea there is, you know, one, one very common example is your password, right? No, nobody needs to know your clear text password, right? If you store it in a one-way hash format, given that you're using the right amount of salt uh, and the right algorithm, you know, even if my database is compromised, you know, I don't have to worry that somebody will be able to recover the clear text password, right? So, whenever possible, right? When, when you don't need the clear text data back, uh, you know, hash it. Uh, so that uh, essentially your kind of your liability is decreased because there's no way to go back to the clear text data, right? With reversible encryption, given that, or I guess in this scenario, the key was compromised, you could always extract the clear text back. With one way hash, there's, there's no possibility. Uh, you know, unless you run a brute force attack, and then given that you are using the right salt uh, and the uh, right uh, algorithm, uh, 
you know, you can make a brute force attack potentially computationally infeasible. Uh, mask sensitive data within the application user interface. So, again, you know, within the application screens, uh, you don't want to show off your social security number, your credit card number, your national ID numbers uh, completely in clear. Uh, and what is the idea? The idea there is, you know, you want to minimize information disclosure, right? So here the attack would be shoulder surfing, right? The, the user's browsing through the application, uh, you know, a malicious attacker walks behind the user's desk, uh, observes the screen and gets hold of this uh, potentially uh, sensitive privacy data. Uh, so from that standpoint, you want to mask it in your uh, user interface uh, so you don't have that uh, kind of a scenario. All right, so, uh, you know, I kind of jumped a little bit to a side track there, but continuing with crypto, right, uh, the, the, the kind of problem is, uh, you know, I'm encrypting data uh, with uh, the right algorithm uh, with the right key length. Now, now the problem kind of shifts to you know how how do I make sure that my keys are secure, right? So a couple of points there. You know one, uh, you know most OSS frameworks provide key stores. So like on Windows, there's a key store that you can use, which you know the Windows takes care of encrypting it on disk. So you know use it to st store the key, right? Because you know, you don't want to end up in a situation where my data is encrypted at rest. However, my key is just world readable, right? Because then you've lost the benefit. If the OS framework is, is not an option, uh, a key store is not an option, you know, consider using a, a two key approach uh, where you have a data encryption key uh, and a key encryption key. So the data encryption key is encrypted with a key encryption key. Uh, and both are stored securely and separate. Uh, so the so the idea is, you know, for a, for an attacker to compromise the end data, uh, you know, they would have to compromise two keys: your data encryption key and then also the key encryption key. Uh, generating the key itself, you know, again, if if the key is hard coded in code, if the key is predictable, you know, all the effort is lost, right? So you want to make sure it's generated randomly, you know, as is if you're using any salts uh, with your one-way hash function, you want to make sure those are also generated randomly uh, mm -hmm. using a secure random number generator or random data generator. And again, you know, most programming platforms, there are APIs available to use it, right? .NET has a RNG crypto service provider, right? OpenSSL has APIs to generate random data. Uh, on Unix, there's a couple of uh, files, slash dev random, slash dev u random, from which you can read uh, to, to get uh, 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 random data. Uh, and finally, key revocation and rotation, right? Uh, so, so what's the idea here, right? Why do I need key rotation? Uh, so the idea is, you know, uh, let's say if my key was compromised, right? If I never change my key, you know, that abuse is going to happen forever, right? There's no way of me to know that, I mean, assuming the key is compromised, but I don't know it happened. There's no kind of, uh, there's no way to limit the damage unless I change the key. So that's the idea behind key rotation, right? So you limit this uh, window when the key could be abused and, and the data could be uh, extracted. Uh, and then similarly, key re revocation is when uh, you know the key is compromised and hence I'm going to have to change it. So within the application, within the product, you know, support these primitives. Support the primitive that, you know, you can go in and change the key. Uh, or for that matter, uh, every three months there will be a new random key generated. Now there are a couple of side effects of this. You know, one, uh, a lot of times, you do have to store or you do have to keep data that has been encrypted with the old key, right? So, you know, what do you do with it? With key rotation, you kind of have two options. You know, I'm, I'm going to keep the old data as is and store my old key securely. Or, you know, I'm going to decrypt all of that old data, 
re-encrypt with the new key and then just throw away the old key, right? So there are a couple of approaches there. Uh, with key revocation, you, you know, the only option you have is to decrypt it uh, and re-encrypt it uh, with the new key. But a couple of uh, side effects there. All right, so that's, you know, that, that's mostly uh, data protection and storage, right? So what we talked about. Now there's this whole other thing of data protection in uh, transit, right? Uh, commonly, you'll have SSL uh, being used to provide this uh, data protection in transit, right? Maybe confidentiality and integrity. Now with SSL configuration, there are a few things to, uh, I guess, keep a note of. Uh, one, you know, make sure you only support SSL v3 or TLS v1, uh, and the idea being SSL v2 has had a few issues like downgrade attack, truncation attack, uh, and, and you don't want your SSL configuration to be susceptible to the same, right? So have uh, only the right version supported. And similar to the ciphers, right? If at the end of the day, SSL supports a bunch of ciphers, uh, based on which it provides you confidentiality, integrity, right? So there are weak ciphers, uh, there are uh, strong ciphers. Uh, you, you don't want the weak ciphers because then potentially somebody could launch a brute force attack on the data stream and get the clear text uh, data back. So make sure you've uh, updated the configuration that it will only allow 128 uh, bit uh, ciphers. Uh, the next point, you know, self-signed certificates are, you know, you might think it's not, I guess, uh, it shouldn't be common, but they are fairly common, right? Uh, the, the problem is, you know, unless and until you can validate the uh, certificate of the server, uh, there's, you know, there's no way to say necessarily that there isn't a man in the middle attack being uh, done at that moment, right? So you want your server certificate to be issued by a well-known trusted certificate authority. Uh, and with that said, uh, you want your client to validate the server certificate before uh, it actually communicates with the server. Now, now that last piece there, if it's a web application, your browser is going to do that for you. You know, if it cannot validate it, uh, it gives you that warning message. Uh, but particularly in thick client applications, from what we have seen, uh, the name check, right? When you validate the server certificate, you know, you're, you're validating it for a number of things. Uh, one is whether it's issued by a trusted uh, root certificate. Uh, another is whether it's uh, expired. Uh, another is whether it is revoked. Uh, and finally, you do want to check if it's issued to the same server that you're trying to connect, right? There could be a legitimate uh, malicious server who has a legitimate certificate but it's not whom you're trying to talk. So you want to uh, kind of uh, uh, do those validations before you actually go ahead and uh, communicate with the server. All right, so th those are like the that data protection uh, uh, in storage and transit. Uh, you know, going to the next category, which is authentication, right? So. You know, so one of the things that you want to think about is whether, you know, you probably have an Active Directory uh, as your internal uh, authentication uh, provider. You might have a third party single sign on solution that you uh, are using within the organization. You know, give it a thought whether you can leverage the same for your application, right? If your application is public facing internet application, you know, maybe you cannot use it, right? You, you probably don't want to create uh, every internet user uh, a, a user account in your AD, right? Uh, but give it a thought. Uh, and the, the, the reason I say that is from an application standpoint, you know, you want your developers to concentrate on the application business functionality, right? Authentication is kind of a common, uh, it's kind of a common problem for all applications, right? So if you have an existing AD store that you can leverage, you know, leverage it. You know, don't spend time uh, reinventing this whole authentication mechanism uh, for the same thing. 
the other, so, so that saves time. The other benefit it gives you is, you know, most compliance <coughs> regulations will kind of uh, tell you about, hey, do you have strong authentication controls, strong password controls, right? And then having it on your AD, you know, one, probably it's already there. Your AD is maybe already secure uh, and has the right uh, password controls. Uh, and two, if not, you know, if you, you have to do it on an AD uh, and as, a, as an application developer, you don't have to worry about it, right? So uh, all of the change password, account lockout, uh, create user, uh, whatnot, you know, everything will be dealt at, at, at an AD level and you won't have to worry about it. So it kind of uh, simplifies the app uh, from an app developer standpoint, uh, less ways to get authentication wrong. Uh, so it's one less variable in the picture. So if it's possible, you know, think about it. Uh, the next one, you know, do not use sensitive data as a user identifier. So, so the, I guess the scenario we run into is, uh, you know, let's say you are using your national ID as the login identifier, user ID, or your credit card number as a user ID, right? Now, user IDs are not typically protected the same way as passwords are, right? You know, uh, passwords are potentially hashed and stored in the database. User IDs, you know, they are pretty much clear text in the database. So they don't get the same level of protection, uh, typically, right? And, and, and that's kind of the idea, right? Don't use sensitive data in there, uh, because if you are, there's chances that it's stored clear text, right? Another side effect of it, and you know, may not be so much compliant, maybe not so much compliance is, you know, if you use a, a, like an ID, like a national ID, social security number, credit card number, as a user ID, as a user, you know, I have no way to change it, right? Let's say if I want to change my user ID, uh, you know, unless I go and apply for a new credit card and get it, there's no way I can change my user ID. So in a way, it's, you know, functionally or from a user standpoint also, it's not the best uh, uh, functionality. Uh, so, you know, as far as possible, do not use uh, sensitive data as your user ID. And then finally, strong password controls, you know, these talk about your password length, your password history, your password expiry, your password complexity. So I think we have a, I have a slide a few, uh, a few slides later, uh, which has a kind of a uh, recommended uh, password controls. You know, and I guess following into authorization, right? Uh, you want to make sure there's authorization for every request, uh, what, which means not only from a display standpoint, right? When I'm displaying the menu options, uh, not only then, but also at a data manipulation standpoint. Uh, and, and, and you know, the things that you want to check for is essentially if the subject has the privilege uh, to perform the action, you know, which typically is create, read, update, delete on the resource, you know, which could be a file, which could be your data, like an account, uh, history, uh, so on and so forth. In the web application world, you know, hidden fields, uh, do not use hidden fields for uh, user or role identifiers. Uh, that's a client side field. It's possible to manipulate it. Uh, similarly for cookies, you know, don't use cookies for role, in a role identifier. Uh, data, again, client side control can be manipulated. Now, uh, user and session management. So, essentially what we are talking about here are user management principles of uh, uh, operations and session management operations, right? So, you know, password recovery scheme, you know, it's similar to cryptography in the sense that it's easier to get it wrong than right, right? And, you know, if you, again, following the news, uh, not too long ago, you know, there was a pretty high profile incident uh, Sarah Palin had her password reset uh, through this uh, password recovery uh, uh, option. 
So, you know, you want to have a secure password recovery. Uh, you know, something along the lines, the user goes to the uh, forgot password page, types in their user ID, you know, the app says, hey, you know, if you enter the right user ID, you'll have a link in your email. Uh, the user goes, uh, you know, checks his email. Uh, there's a there's a HTTPS link which you know is only valid for a few hours, and is a one-time uh, link. Clicks the link. Uh, the application then asks the user to answer the security questions that uh, he or she has set up. And you know, once they have answered it correctly, the application allows the user to reset the password. Right. Uh, once the password is reset. Uh, uh, the application should send a notification to the user, hey, you know, your password's been reset. Uh, so, uh, you know, the idea is not to have a kind of a, uh, a weak link in this entire thing. Uh, so that's with the password recovery. Now, you know, when you create a new user, uh, you want to make sure that uh, the initial password that the user is assigned is random. Right. It shouldn't be fixed for all users, uh, and neither should it be predictable. Right? Like if my initial password is my birth date, you know that's predictable. Right? So you want to have it completely random, uh, uh, and mark it as expired so that you know the user is the one uh, when he first uses it is made to change it. Uh, support the disabling and re-enabling of user accounts. Uh, so, you know, within your application, make sure there's a, there's a facility uh, which allows the admin to say, hey, you know, this user is temporarily locked. Uh, and, you know, once the user uh, has, you know, reset the password or whatnot, you can re-enable it. Uh, the next one, more in the web application world, uh, these web applications use session IDs to track the user sessions. Uh, as far as possible, you know, do not generate them on your own, right? There are uh, underlying frameworks, uh, like for example, uh, IIS, ASP.NET, uh, give you ASP.NET session ID, ASP.XR. Uh, on the Java world, you have J session ID. Uh, and these framework issued session IDs are, you know, are random or sufficiently random so that you don't have an issue of somebody uh, brute forcing or guessing another session ID uh, and accessing another user's data, right? So uh, do not generate session IDs. Uh, as far as possible, use the, uh, uh, the framework issues ones. Uh, email notifications to the user about security sensitive events. So the, the, the intent here is, you know, let's say the user's password was to be compromised, right, or was to be reset uh, by an attacker. You know, having the application email out notifications to the user that, hey, you know, uh, your password attempt, password change attempt succeeded, right, or for that matter, you know, if somebody's trying to brute force somebody's account, if the account gets locked out, you know, send an email saying, hey, uh, you had, you know, five or X amount of uh, failed attempts, your account is logged out. You know, the, the, the victim can essentially look at these emails and identify that, you know, there's something suspicious uh, going on and then can report to the uh, application support desk uh, so that there can be necessary steps taken. Uh, so have this feedback loop, uh, email notifications uh, from that standpoint. Uh, user session inactivity. Uh, so the the you know the the concept here uh, again this is more in the web world. Uh, but you know if if my session ID is compromised, right? Uh, I guess not compromised. But uh, let's say you know I'm using the application. You know I walk away from the desk, right? Uh, somebody else walking by. You know if my session never terminates. Right, due to inactivity, uh, you know, they'll be able to abuse my session, right? So having an inactivity timeout kind of uh, stops that uh, abuse, right? You know, if, I, if I'm not active on the application for, let's say, 15 minutes, you know, it's going to uh, deactivate the uh, 
session on the server uh, and make me log in again, right? So that, that's kind of the, uh, the concern there. All right, uh, data validation. Now, you know, this, you know, you want to treat all user input as bad input or evil input. So you want to have high length range format uh, checks. Uh, however, you know, there are certain class, there's like a certain class of vulnerability, you know, the injection attacks. The whole, I mean, I mean the main purpose of this injection attack or the main impact of this in, you know, injection attack is to extract data. You, you know, with SQL injection, sure, you could do much more damaging things. You could compromise the whole SQL server. Uh, but the, the primary intent of doing SQL injection is to extract data, right? And, and that is exactly what these uh, compliance regulations are trying to, trying to safeguard the data. So, you know, at the very least, you want to use parameterized queries uh, to prevent SQL injection. Uh, you want to use uh, parameterized or bind queries for, uh, to prevent LDAP injection. Similar uh, in the XPath world, uh, where XPath is a querying language for XML data sets. Uh, so similar uh, things. Uh, command injection, uh, you know, you don't want to have uh, the user uh, input uh, concatenated to a command that's then run on the uh, server. Uh, and then finally, cross-site scripting, again, you know, one of these high-profile uh, vulnerability categories uh, where you want to use uh, output encoding so that your user uh, doesn't have to uh, worry about uh, uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Now, uh, in terms of uh, exceptional exception handling, uh, in the web world, again, you know, one of the things that you can do is have a custom error page, right? Which all it says is, hey, you know, uh, we encountered an error. Uh, here's the exception code. Uh, you know, please try again the operation. Or you know, if you still keep on getting this, call the help desk with this exception code, uh, and they can uh, give you the exact details, uh, or I guess extract the details. The idea is, you know, you don't want stack trace or any verbose information going back to the user because that's in a way. Uh, information disclosure, which, you know, could allow the attacker to plan their next steps uh, and finally get access to this data. Uh, handle uh, all ex known exceptions. So, in some of the, uh, I guess in some of the uh, uh, compliance regulations, there's a concern about availability, right? Now, there are different ways to do a denial of service attacks. You know, one way is to, you know, send specially crafted input to the server so that it generates an exception uh, and crashes, right? So, to, I guess, prevent against that particular uh, kind of attack, you want to handle all known exceptions so that, you know, you don't crash at runtime and end up in a, uh, a, a denial of service situation. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, before you have your catch all handler, you want a specific exception handler, right? So maybe file exception, IO exception, memory exception. Uh, so that way uh, you don't lose any of the exception detail. All right. Auditing and logging. So auditing uh, is, uh, is, you know, is highly stressed on uh, in these uh, compliance regulations. Uh, and essentially, you know, Without an audit log, if an, if an incident happened, right, there's no way to identify, you know, how it happened, what was the damage, uh, there's just no way, right. So, so from that standpoint, you know, an audit log is absolutely critical and essential, right. So somebody, somebody looking at the log, the audit file should be able to say, you know, hey, you know, who did what to whom and when, right, essentially create, be able to create this timeline uh, based on which you can investigate the incident uh, and uh, take the uh, appropriate action. Now, from, from an audit log, logging standpoint, you know, what events uh, or what do you want to log? You know, you want to log 
uh, all attempts to access objects, right, may be failed, may be successful, right. And similar to logging, right, you want to log all successful and failed uh, login attempts. Uh, so, you know, what's the idea there is, you know, you, if you're only logging the successful uh, events, uh, you might have somebody trying to brute force a user account uh, and unless you log the failed attempt, you know, you won't, you won't, I guess, you won't see that attack in action, right? You will miss that event. So you want to log both successful and failed. Uh, and similarly, all administrative actions, you know, like create new user, uh, reset user password, so on and so forth, uh, so that you can have a kind of a uh, complete audit log. Uh, and with that audit log, you also want to have certain metadata, right? With every log event, you want certain metadata like the date and time, the date and time of the event. Uh, the source of the action, IP address, uh, the user who was requesting the service, uh, the result, success, failure. Uh, it doesn't say here, but you also probably want to add things like uh, the source code file, line numbers, module name, process ID, uh, so that you know somebody who's looking at a log file, the audit log, can create a timeline. Uh, now, what should not be logged? Uh, you don't want to log sensitive data, right? Credit card numbers, any authentication data like passwords, uh, token values. Uh, you know, do not uh, do not log that because those that sensitive uh, authentication credential. All right. Now, configuration management. Uh, you want to be able to support uh, configuration of the log file itself. Uh, people have different uh, configurations in the environment. If you are using any third party uh, app components, uh, make sure they, they are not deployed with the uh, fixed default credentials. You know, similarly, if you create new users within the application, have uh, dynamic random passwords. And then here's the, the kind of best practices for crypto and password controls. Now, you know, all this that we talked about so far is more technology oriented, right? Uh, but there are things from a developer standpoint uh, that compliance regulation will also stand, uh, will also touch, uh, which are essentially uh, people and process. So things like, you know, train your development team, uh, your testing team, your architects in uh, software security so that they can uh, uh, design secure software, uh, establish secure coding guidelines, uh, you know, perform prompt security code reviews, testing, uh, and then I guess do not use production data in test, right? That's, that's pretty uh, bad because production data is real. Uh, and then finally, you know, all these third party libraries that you're using, you know, have somebody in your development team uh, regularly monitor the updates, the vulnerabilities uh, in these third party components so that if there are any, you can patch and then uh, your application won't be vulnerable. Right, so that's kind of all I have, all we had, uh, you know, all I had. Uh, there's an article in the software magazine that uh, I'm writing, which will be out soon, uh, and then a couple of references on MSDA, uh, which also talk about compliance. So I guess uh, I'll open it up for. I guess we have a few minutes uh, for questions, comments.